Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Very Thank nice you. to be here, Andre. Thank Our you. pleasure. I, I want to start right out with, um, because this show and this uh, channel that we have is very much dedicated to the arts in Asheville, the creative spirit in mm -hmm. Asheville. I'd like you to just both reflect a little bit on what it's like, your first visit in Asheville, the creativity, the music. Tell, tell us a little bit about your visit. Well, very surprised to find in the middle of the South and South and, 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 and North Carolina here, the, the mountains here, to find the amount of uh, culture that's here, the artistic, it, it's obviously a university town, a college town, and uh, it's really very, was very, very surprising to me and refreshing to come out of, you know, sort of redneck area into this bastion of, 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 of absolutely beautiful people and uh, a lot of talent. We noticed uh, street musicians, buskers that were really good. They were playing like country music, but really good country music. We really yeah. enjoyed it. Sure. And uh, the, there seems to be a spirit here which I didn't expect. I, I was thinking, oh, Moogfest, you know, there'll be a few people, maybe a few 500 something like that the whole town is Moogfest I couldn't believe it <laughs> the, you know we walk in there and they've got the streets closed up <laughs> the main street Broadway is I mean just, it was just a mind blower for me I had absolutely no idea that this was going on but also the gratification that it gave me to find so many people into the type of music that when 40 years ago when Bob Moog first brought out the, the synthesizer that became the first synthesizer that was really usable by ordinary people and available, um, what, f from that time when there were maybe half a dozen of us, now it's like th th there's musicians, there's synthesizers, the place is packed. I can't believe it. It's absolutely phenomenal. It makes my heart glad. Wow. That's, Everybody's on the synthesizer that's down here. You tell us. <laughs> Man, everyone's on the synthesizer. Everyone plays something electronic, something for the future. Man, this is this is really off the chain down here now. Also, I started. I came down here for the first time, like almost forty years ago. So, on and a tour. Yeah. Who who were you we on tour with? I used to play with this uh, Motown singing group. I won't even name them. Okay. But um, we used to play all the venues here, like okay. uh, opening acts and doing the Orange Pill is the place that I remember. Right. The most, and last night we went to see the groups there. Man, that place didn't have a floor in it when we played in it. <laughs> it was a dirt floor. Wow. So now to see the people down here and the way that they embrace the music, and then we go around, people talking about uh, the artists that we've worked with. Of course, they know who's Malcolm's, all the sure. stuff, but as soon as you say Gil, and they go, hey, I do know you guy, or something, or right. the music y'all did was beautiful. It's, just, it's, it's beautiful, man. It's really nice. It's warm down here, finally. That's fantastic. <laughs> No, I'm very happy that you got a, a great day of weather because we had a little rain. The weather mm -hmm. is beautiful here. We're 2,100 feet above sea level and mm -hmm. you know, on average and um, great weather. We're actually in a temperate rainforest. Really? We get enough rain. We had the second most rain in the United States of America last year in July. Um, Hilo, Hawaii was number one. We were really? What happened? So what happened to Washington State? They got a lot of rain, but we, that's how much rain we got last year. It was <laughs> unbelievable. We are a rainforest by the technical wow. definition, right, definition. Uh, the amount of flora and fauna. And mm -hmm. So I do hope you come back and, and, and enjoy it some more. Yeah, we noticed yeah. how green it's it was great. here and how beautiful. Yeah. It was yeah. like, it's remarkably beautiful here. Mm -hmm. I mean, stunningly so. Yeah. Now, that, that's, that's a great snapshot to, to, to hear from you, you gentlemen. So welcome. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. I want to jump into a few things, and we're going to jump around a little bit, but... Um, <laughs> I want to talk about uh, how you, you both started in music, of course, but uh, uh, let me jump right to kind of a nexus that brings you to this place here. Um, of course, um, you both have done a lot of jazz playing. You're, you're both bass players, actually, so there's a lot of different parallels. But, but Malcolm, um, you were speaking yesterday about playing jazz in London and mm -hmm. in the late 40s, 50s, and early 60s. And, but I want to just jump for a minute, since we're at this electronic festival, talk to us a little bit about um, late 60s, early 70s, when you, you were working with synthesizers and you formed the, the Tonto's Expanding Headband Project. Tell us a little bit about synthesizers, how you got into that. Well, uh, it was very interesting. I came to America um, by way of South Africa uh, and long trip across the Pacific, which I won't 
bore you with the details, but basically because of the, it was in 1968 um, and it was because of the Six Day War uh, where the Suez Canal, they sunk all the ships in the Suez Canal. I was supposed to go by ship because I had two bases, a cello, a trunk of stuff and everything. Wow. And I was trying to flee from apartheid Africa where they were uh, trying to uh, put me in jail next to Mandela on Robin Island for putting on mixed race concerts. Right. And I just got out by the skin of my teeth with the help of an Africana speaking uh, a white African speaking uh, bass playing student of mine who hid me out and I was a fugitive front page of the papers and everything and he hid me out and smuggled me out through uh, uh, Mozambique where I got on this ship uh, after it took me about six weeks to find the ship uh, hmm. that was going to America and officially we were supposed to go up it was a cargo ship with 12 passenger Births and the other 11 passenger berths were filled with couples in their retirement doing their round the world trip. And in the 12th cabin, there was this 92 year old ex town clerk from Santa Barbara wow. and me. Wow. <laughs> Oldest and the youngest on board. I was 30 at the time. That's so, <laughs> by far. And we got on like a house on fire, the two of us. We had a great time. He was the best shuffleboard player I ever met. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> he had been going on the boats since he retired at 65. He said it was a lot cheaper than retiring in the States. So he'd been traveling around. And every port we went into, he knew all the people. And so it was, it was great fun to be around him. And uh, he was a very interesting guy. But uh, what happened was we were supposed to go up the east coast of Africa, stopping at various ports to load. There's a cargo ship after all. And while they were loading, these couples would go off and do a safari and come back. You know, th this was the whole trip. That was the reason that, that they were on it. I was just trying to get to the States. Right. And uh, we got up as far as Ethiopia, a Saab in Ethiopia up the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And we're waiting there. And they, they, they don't have any cranes or anything in these African ports. Mm -hmm. Everything is loaded by men. Right. <coughs> Manpower. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything is loaded by hand, by men, teams of men. And they sing these songs works so to keep them in, in because they're mm -hmm. carrying heavy stuff and they all work together uh, like a little uh, little groups and they're all singing as they go it was very, very interesting well anyway we loaded up on the, like the third day and then we're sitting there the fourth day nothing's happening and i'm thinking well why aren't we leaving you know and the fifth day still nothing happens. so i go chatting <coughs> to the officers and they're very cagey about what's going on and of course we didn't have any news there wasn't any internet back sure. then there wasn't any <laughs> radio really that we could understand because we're, we're, we're in ethiopia right. we can't get any british english speaking radio there it was yeah. you know too far away in the middle of nowhere so Eventually, we got told what was going on about the Six Day War and how the Suez Canal was blocked. So we Stop. couldn't wow. go up the Suez Canal and mm -hmm. they were waiting for re to, to have it be rerouted and what to do from Holland because the ship was a Dutch ship with Dutch officers but with an all Chinese crew from Hong Kong. So uh, the, 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 the word came down that the uh, route had been changed. We were now going to head out over the Pacific and instead of going up through the Suez Canal, Mediterranean, straight to Gibraltar, Atlantic, New York, we were going to go Seychelles Islands, Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, wow. um, you know, the, uh, uh, east, the West Coast, Asia, right? San Francisco. So wow. I get rerouted to San Francisco. Well, the whole trip from beginning to end from the time I got on the boat was three months. Wow. And it was fantastic. We crossed the, the, the Pacific and I arrived in California and I tried to get work you know as a bass player you know and of course i hadn't got a green card i came in as a visitor and what and, year is this this is 1968 68 okay and i come in as a, as a visitor and and uh, i've got two bases a cello and say, oh what do you mean you visit oh i'm on my way to canada yeah, right. <laughs> and i want to see america before i do so they gave me a three-month visa and um to cut to the chase i tried to get into uh i went down to los angeles where i knew some musician friends who i'd worked with in africa with lenny kazan uh lloyd morales and uh um the, her, her uh, peter davis her her conductor uh and uh, it, it was a, a very interesting uh relationship and lloyd uh invited me to come down and stay with him uh in in los angeles so i did that and he got me hooked up with uh, Pat Boone uh, studio because we discovered I couldn't work 
they didn't have green cards, so I couldn't legally, work. Right, so right. Legally, so and I, a jazz player, you can't work under somebody else's name. Sure. But Lloyd had found this guy called uh, Cecil Smythe, in right. the who, who he knew, who's like an 85-year-old bass player. In, in Local 47, who wasn't playing anymore, and Lloyd knew him, and he called him up and told him the situation, he said, could, could Malcolm use your card, because his name is C Cecil, so it was like Cecil Smythe, sure. so it was close <laughs> enough yeah, that yeah, I could say, not? Malcolm Cecil Smythe, Malcolm Cecil is my stage name, yeah, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. here's my card, Cecil Smythe is my real name, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. and there's no picture on it, right? so, yeah, yeah. so I got away with it, and I toured for the first year with Lainey Kazan, and to cut to, to, to a long story short, sh there were three attempts to get me into the country, each of which got harder as we went on because it was to do with the Civil Rights Act coming in. Sure, no sure. longer a British quota. Now I'm in line behind everybody coming up from Mexico and everybody coming in from the Orient. Right, and right. you know, the line's 20,000 long. Sure, sure. And I'm just 20,001. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and sorry, no go. So I ended up having to go to New York. And um, I had built the first 16-track studio in Los Angeles for Pat Boone because his manager, Jack Spina, realized my technical capabilities because I've been in the Air Force for four years and was thoroughly conversant with te technical sure. things. I'd had my own Recording electronics systems. consultancy business in, in England prior to that. So uh, I was, you know, that was something I could do. And uh, I ended up getting a job, being offered a job at the record plant for a six-week stint. And the job was very peculiar. Um, my job was to go in there and fix stuff that the engineers had purposely broken. <laughs> and the reason they purposely broken it was because the record plant in New York was going to be sold to a company called TVI, who was a public company. Okay. Now, that, they had, uh, the, obviously the public company had to be a union shop. Now, none of the engineers working at the record plant were union engineers. And the word got out that the place was going to be sold and they were all going to get fired. Mm. Right. And, but there was a caveat to this, which was that all the equipment had to be in working order. Oh. So the guys were breaking the breaking. equipment right. every night. And they, were, they knew what they were doing. They knew they could put, yeah, it, yeah. put, put it back. Reverse whatever Extend they did. Their yeah. Yeah. But they, so, so, and the maintenance guy who was, on, uh, who was on there couldn't keep up with it. He was just, he, he was like frazzled, razzled by it, and he just left. So I was gone for this six week stint, and the caveat for me was, they would sign my immigration papers. They sure. would. They yeah. would. Record plant would sponsor me. Now this is the when it was sold. It would be record plant public company sponsoring me. Mm -hmm. Now they got more clout than you know right, Pat right. Boone and uh, 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 Lainey Kazan had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is public company. Oh yeah, it must be all right. And of course they covered all the bases about offering me the right sort of money, so on and so on and so forth. So, uh, the, 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 of course, comes the, the end of the six weeks. I would be fired too because I'm not a union guy. Sure. I'm, not even, I'm not even officially in the country. So, <laughs> so certainly not union. So um, this was the, you know, the basic uh, situation I found myself in. And so at the end of the six weeks, I managed to get everything fixed and it was it, I used to come in at five o'clock at night and what, keep on working until I'd done and undoing what all, all the stuff that they'd done during sure. the day and it became, became like a cat and mouse game you know <laughs> it breaks down. I come in and find it fix it next morning they come back break it again it's fixed. Oh, no, they, had, they knew they had to break something right, else, so right. they'd do something. And you'd be surprised what they got up to. Unbelievable stuff. In one case, they took the head block off of an eight-track machine and they undid the head block and then they put a piece of metal, quarter inch thick metal, under one side of it, screwed it down wow. again, so the whole head block was like this. this so you were going through, if you were trying to record on track seven, you would record on track seven, but it would play back on track six. Hmm. And everything, it was like crazy. It's Nobody chaos knew. for all the mixes. It, it took me a while to find that, and then I came, I came in and found this thing, and I took the thing out, and everything was fixed. Right. <laughs> it was, was booby-trapped. So yeah, the, the whole uh, idea was yeah. they were trying to scotch the deal. Hold on mm -hmm. to their jobs. Hold on to well, it didn't happen. So you know, um, I, I'm afraid I was the cause of a lot of, a lot of engineers losing their jobs in, uh, right. in, 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 at that time. You kept fixing stuff, right? right. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> when I when I finally got to the end of that, uh, Chris Stone, who was the uh, president of the record plant at the time, Chris Stone um, said, "Okay, well, you know, you've done a fantastic job, Malcolm. Here's the paperwork. I've signed it now. This is your sponsored paperwork, and then I'm going to sign this other thing." And he gave me a five thousand dollar bonus check. Wow! And he also gave me a piece of paper. And mm -hmm. On the piece of paper, it said, 
315 West 57th Street, Bob Walters. And he handed me this thing. He said, uh, go to this address, ask for this man, tell him that I said he needs you. So I go, okay, now I've never done anything like this in my life before. I've been very fortunate and the work has always come to me. I've never had to go look for it. Um, and in England, you know, it's an island culture, so you're known from a very early age if you've got the promise, everybody knows. So I never had to look for work as bass player, I never had to look for work as an agent, nothing. It, it, was, it came to me. Yeah. So this is the first time I'm going out and I'm trying to get Actively, a job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I feel a little bit strange about it, but I think, hey, I'll try it. So I go to 350 and it's like this big church door. And I go in and I see media sound and I thought, oh, mm. this is a recording studio. And I walk down and, and I go to the receptionist and I say, um, excuse me, I'd like to see Bob Walters, please. Now he's the president of the company, right? You don't just walk in the door as a stranger yeah, and say, I want to see the president. Oh, what, do, what do you want to see? You? What is yeah. your business? I said, I said well, um, Chris Stone tell, uh, said to tell Bob Walters that he needs me. So the girl on the desk didn't know, I could be a client. I could be anything, you know, she doesn't know. So she's very polite. So she calls up and says, excuse me, Mr. B Mr. Walters, there's a man here who uh, puts me on the phone. I said, uh, so what's it about? I said, well, my, uh, <coughs> I have, uh, 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 I, I, I was told to tell you that Chris Stone from the record plant told me, uh, uh, believes that you need me. You know, he told me to tell you, you need me. Mm. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm a, I'm a technical engineer, and I fix things, and so I go, come on up. <laughs> so I go up to his office, he calls in his chief engineer, and to cut a long story short, the, the, he, he started interviewing me, and I had a little tool case with me with a magnetometer in it. I had learned about magnetometers from Ampex, I've been on a course in Ampex to find it. They had the 16 track machine, Master Muncher, the MM1000, okay. we called wow. it the Master Muncher. And <laughs> very interesting uh, little machine, big machine. It was a converted video machine, two inch tape. And there were no, there was only one inch machines in New York at that time. And I'd put the first 16 track studio with an MM1000 in for Pat Boone. It was the first one in LA. So now, um, in, in New York, New York I, I, I'm, I'm, I have found out that, that, that this, you know, about this, this, this little device called a magnetometer. Now, when you line up a tape machine, one of the first things that you have to know is whether or not the heads are magnetized. Because if the heads are magnetized and you put a tape on it, it can erase them. Mm -hmm. So we have a tradition to demagnetize de de the head. Sure, sure. And the, tr the problem is when you demagnetize the heads, it's a hand thing and mm -hmm. it's a technique. And if right. you don't do it right, you can leave the heads Feel. more magnetized right. than they were when you started. I remember doing that, yeah. So, uh, and it's very common fault. And so right. it's a very dangerous procedure. But if you have a magnetometer, you can put it at the heads and if it deflects, then they're magnetized. You yeah. Now you need to demagnetize it. It doesn't deflect. You need something to tell you, is it magnetized or not? Nothing else will tell right. you. you got a base, base, so, and it's know. a meter with no leads. It's magnet. Mm -hmm. It's just a round meter. And it, 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 so, so I open up my case and uh, I've, made, I've made this Sony mic case. I lined it with some uh, a, a sponge rubber and I'd cut out all my tools, my tweezers, my, my, my small wrenches sure. and all, all the little special tools that I use to align machines and, and do my maintenance work. And this thing's in the middle. So. <laughs> the chief, this, this Fred Porter, the chief engineer, he says, okay, uh, what, is, is that a microphone you bought there? Yeah. I said, no, 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 it's my tool case. And I opened it up and <clears throat> he looks at the meter and he says, what's that? I said, T tables were turned. It was like, yeah. you don't know what that is? Sure. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, yeah. you don't have one of these? He says, uh, no, what is it? I said, it's a magnetometer. And he says, well, what do you use it for? I said, well, how, what do you do when you align a tape machine? Now, I'm interviewing him. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> I thought everyone had the, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. that, that's well, like what, do you do, what do you do when you align the tape machine? He said, well, first thing I do is demagnetize it and clean the heads. I said, well, wait a minute. How do you know the heads are, 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 are need demagnetizing? He said, well, it's just routine. You always demagnetize. I said, no, no, you can, you, if you don't do it right, you can magnetize it. Just you reverse the you. You can, procedure, yeah. You can, yeah. So, 
He's like, well, I said, no, you have to have one of these. Said, I'm surprised that you don't have this. This is, this is, you know, basic, basic, basic technology. State of the art so, tool, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Bob Walters has heard enough. He, he turns and says, okay, Fred, you can leave us now. Said, Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and he turns around to me, as soon as Fred's gone, he says, would you like the job of chief engineer here? Now, I've just been responsible for firing maybe 10 people. Right, yeah. I don't yeah. want to fire nobody else. <laughs> I got my green card going in. I don't need any trouble. I don't need anybody yeah. reporting me for firing right, right. and not, not being a, you know. Sure. So I'm diplomatic as well. I've learned to do that. The BBC trained me as a producer. And diplomacy is a very important part of that. So I said, well, you know, what about Fred? You know, and he was, he was one of these nine to fivers with the pocket protector and the whole thing. It wasn't really, but because, Media Sound was service the advertising, Madison Avenue advertising. Okay. Mm. They had sessions, Jingles, strings yeah, for an hour, hour, horns for an hour, percussion for an hour, and so on. So this was the, the, the general situation. There. They weren't a recording studio for records, but they wanted to be. And so because I'd been at the record plot, obviously I knew about that side of things. So Bob Walters said to me, well, look, you know, why don't we let Fred be the stay, stay on the chief engineer position and you become the chief engineer at night mm -hmm. after five o'clock, after Fred leaves, you take over. Okay. And that way we don't have to fire him. Comfort, and he's, yeah. He does good yeah. work and so on and so forth. He's just a pretty straight guy right. and he can't keep up with it here. And he has no vision about what to do to bring record business in. I said, well, I know what to do. We'll put a 16-track studio in, in down in the basement. And, so, so. Mm -hmm. and he was like, okay, this, this is all cool. So I get the job. So I go downstairs, and my first day, Monday, I go in, and uh, I'm, I'm working in the uh, studio there, and I go into Studio A, which is in a converted church, much like the building like, like next door here, and okay. yeah. uh, with a, a control room much like that built into the, the room there, and an ISO booth next to it. That was the extent of it. And in the ISO booth is this strange looking contraption that I don't recognize. I've never seen one in my life before. Uh -huh. And I'm, you know, I'm servicing the board and I ask about this thing. Does this, this, this belong to the studio? No, no, this doesn't belong to the studio. This belongs to a guy called Bob Margaleff. Uh, 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 he's uh, the Mogist in residence. I said, Mogist in residence? What is that? He says, right. well, you know, sometimes in the ads, what they want is that they need sound effects and things like that, you know, yeah. like Ford Torino. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> and, so this was what Bob was doing because at that time the synthesizer was not accurate enough. There were problems mm -hmm. technologically with it. Right. The tuning was off. The, uh, it was not touch sensitive. It wasn't polyphonic. Uh, there were lots of reasons why musicians weren't using Isn't it. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so Going it was being tune. used as a sound effect sure. machine. Sci-fi movies and. But you see, yeah. I didn't know this at the time. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm looking at it. Voltage controlled oscillators. Gee, I know all about voltage control. I learned about that in the service. I had a voltage controlled plotting table sure. in, in, in one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, RAF stations that I worked at, and it was like, okay, I understand voltage controlled oscillator. I didn't know you could do that, but that's great. Oh, voltage controlled filter. That I know what a filter is. That's great. Sure. Voltage control. Interesting. And you see a keyboard, and, which and I see a keyboard. You're a piano player for years at this yeah, point. Yeah, and, 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 and I look at the. Uh, I, I look at this other thing, and then I see these things. It says envelope generator. I mm. thought, wow, this thing could actually make envelopes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, this is really an interesting one. I'm looking around, see where you put in the paper. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then envelope follower. Envelope. What? This thing follow the mailman? What's going on? <laughs> right, right. right? I don't get it. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, and voltage control amplifier. Well, okay, I can understand sure. that, but why would you want a voltage control and amplifier? I don't get this. You know? Cut off. And then what are, sequencer. What, are they what is the sequencer thing? <laughs> and there's lots of knobs on it, and there's another thing called interface. I'm going, yeah. I don't get this. And, but worst of all, the whole thing where the on off switch is, is an ignition switch, like a car. Oh, wow. And no, no key in it. Now, you know, I can go around the back hot wire it. Right. Sure. But number one, I'm told it doesn't belong to the studio. And number two, if somebody's gone to the trouble to put a, an ignition switch on it, they don't want they you don't hot want wiring it, yeah, yeah. clearly. So I just thought, patience, Malcolm. Eventually, the person who 
put on that switch, the person who has the switch will show up mm -hmm. eventually. And I was warned by all the other engineers, oh, this guy who owns that, he's a weird guy, you, 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 nobody likes him. Blah, blah. So what they had done is they had only shown him how, he wasn't really much of an engineer, he, he, he had bought the Moog because he had done a movie and he needed the soundtrack for it. And he this thought is he could Robert. Do it. This, this is Robert. This is Robert. Robert Lovestow, yeah. And, and, and he, he, thought, he thought he could um, do the soundtrack with it. It turned out a little bit more difficult than he thought, so he was left with this instrument that he had to pay for. And he, he bought <laughs> it on the on, on low. He bought a, took taken out bank loan and he, he was paying, for, paying off for sure. this thing. It was like, what, 12, 15,000? I don't know, it was a Moog 3C. At that point, yeah. So that, was, that was about the price of them, I think, between 10 and 12, 15 grand. Back wow. then. Wow. And um, which was big money back then, 1970, 1968, 70. So I see this strange thing, and I'm, I wait. It's five days before 11 o'clock at night. See, I remember I'm still working nights. Working nights, so yeah, yeah. 11 o'clock Friday night, in walks this guy with hair down to his, his, his rear end, wearing a fur coat down to his ankles. It was winter. I found out later his father was a furrier. That's why I had the oh, fur coat. Okay. But uh, it was a very good fur coat. I okay. recognized good fur. My mother used to have a thing about furs. So um, anyhow, uh, he walks in and he, he, I look at him and he looks at me and I think, this must be Bob Margliff. And he looks at me and he goes, Pat, he told me later, he thinks, ah, oh, this must be that new British engineer right. that I've been hearing about. <laughs> so he says to me, oh, hi, uh, my name is Bob Margliff. Uh, who are you? And I said, Oh, my name is Malcolm Cecil, and uh, I'm uh, the new tech here. I'm, I'm doing the maintenance work. And he, the, the the engineers had shown Bob how to record because that's what he had to do, doing the, his his uh, mogus things Thing, yeah. for the advertising things. But they hadn't shown him how to overdub and play back because in those days the board was either in record or remix. Uh, uh, yeah. And nobody had shown him there was a switch and what happened when you switched and how <laughs> things changed and so on and so forth. So he says to me, um, tell me, uh, do you know how to run this board and, this, and record? I said, I better, I have to fix it. And I said to him, do you know how to run that thing? He said, I'd better, I own it. Uh, <laughs> I said to him, well, I'll tell you what, meeting. I will show you how to run this if you show me how to run that. He sticks out his hand, he says, deal. Oh. <coughs> so we went into the room there. I got a tape out. We put the tape up. And it was a one inch tape and it was like 27 minutes of tape. So, you know, per track. So we put the tape up, we put it in record, Bob knows how to do that. So, and it's, we start experimenting. Now, I don't know if you've heard the, 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 the wall record. The, 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 the Wonder Wall, Wonder oh, wall. The, the George Harrison, right? Yeah, we were well, talking about that. George yeah. told me, sure. I, I worked with George on, uh, 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 as part of an album I did with Dave Mason from Traffic. Oh, sure. I did an album with him and George was one of the guest artists. Mm -hmm. We spent three days together sitting next to each other at the console. George Harrison So the George, Beatles, yeah. I got a chance to talk to him about it. And I, said, I asked him about this. This was later, much later, many years later. Mm -hmm. I said, him, you know, what this Wonder Wall record, what, what was it about? How, how, how did you come to make that? He says, oh, well, actually, that was just like uh, uh, Paul Beaver, who was the representative for Moog in LA, right. was showing me how the thing worked, and I just recorded it, and then I went <laughs> back and I did a few things, and, you know, it wasn't really a serious musical thing. It was just some experimental sounds. Messing and, around, yeah. and I was just messing around, and mainly it was Paul Beaver messing around showing me the stuff. And he was quite straight about it, you know. So wow. they, 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 he was like very nonchalant about, well, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. That was <laughs> it. So that was exactly what our tw first 27 minutes of recording sounded like. We were getting things in tune, sure. we were turning things around, getting sounds and so on. And so on. Robert's doing all these things, and I'm watching and, so mm -hmm. and learning. And so, to cut a long story short, we ended up, that became our first piece of music. Mm -hmm. It became that, Aurora on, oh, on that, it really? was originally From 27 minutes of this, and then the, the thing that I'd been taught at the BBC when I got too sick to play with the radio orchestra and they wanted to keep me because I was the youngest principal they'd ever had by far, I was 27, the next youngest was like mid 40s, mm. and they, they didn't want to lose me. And so they officially should have fired me after three months of sick leave, but they 
transferred me over and trained me as a producer. And because I'd had four years of serving Her Majesty, because the BBC is a British Broadcasting Corporation, chartered to the Queen. Mm -hmm. So my four years experience counted and I was able to become uh, trained as a producer if I had six weeks of familiarization. And the six weeks of familiarization wow. that they trained me was tape editing. I'll take it. So yeah. I went into, the, uh, the, the 27 minutes got edited down to seven minutes, sure. which is what Aurora is. It's hey, the seven, the, mi the seven minutes of good stuff wow. out of that 27, first 27 minutes. So, that's so that was how I started with Bob. And, and Bob and I, what happened was, with, you know, within a week, Bob had turned around to me and said, Listen, man, you know, let's, I'll make you a 50% partner in this. Let's just, we weren't making an album. We right. were not trying to do anything. I was trying to create things. I had been working with John McLaughlin doing things in 21.8. Nobody could, the drummers couldn't rock. Wow. Uh, and and, and but John and I just played these things because we felt them. Mm -hmm. And then trying to explain them to other people was really difficult. So we ended up, uh, you know, doing the Edinburgh Festival one year and we did this thing in 21.8. But he was the only musician in England that Doing that, could that see kind of that I could communicate with that could do it and we couldn't do everything and also the new sounds were really interesting to me these unusual sounds so I decided that this would be a very good thing to make this instrument playable one of the problems was that you couldn't keep the damn thing in tune right. it would drift once you got into it, it would drift number one number two you couldn't keep it in tune for more than two octaves and uh, there, were, there were all sorts of problems, which I eventually solved. That's why we built Tonto, mm. right. was to solve the problems. Just go yeah. in a whole other direction, yeah. <coughs> yeah, and so eventually, uh, you know, the, the, that was the, the basic, uh, you know, first uh, meeting with, with it. So Bob, sure. Bob was saying to me, okay, I'll make you a 50% partner. He said, well, I didn't realize at the time what that meant was, we were going to take out a loan together, he was going <laughs> yeah. to take the money back. Yeah. <laughs> and now I was 50% responsible, responsible for playing back for the whole thing. <laughs> for the Vogue, right? Uh. So, so I'm immediately six or seven grand in debt. Yeah, yeah, right away. <laughs> right away. But, but that first jam, that first night became the track of Rory. That, was, right. that was the Right off the bat. You hit right record, you just said, let's. Psh, yeah, and I showed him how this. to play back. We, and yeah. we did overdubbing. For the right. first time, he was and able to put more than one line. Because right. all they ever needed was like. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thing, yeah. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. those sort of things. Sound, musical sound effects. Absolutely, yeah. And here we are trying to make music. Now, the first Moogs were not touch sensitive, they were not polyphonic. polyphonic right. uh, they were like, they were like back to the days of uh, the organ or the harpsichord, Bach, sure. the Baroque period. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's why switched on Bach worked. Sure. as the music because yeah. that was baroque music Monophonic it was written lines. for instruments that did not have touch sensitivity yeah. there were no pianos mm -hmm. piano wasn't invented until much later and yeah, beethoven was yeah. the pianist you know and that's sure, what changed sure. the, from baroque to it was haydn was the first one to 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 go into the to, to the classical official I and mean, you know we talk about classic music but there's baroque was before sure. classic then there's classics it was only Plain 50 chan, years baroque, there classical. was haydn there was mozart there was beethoven sure and beethoven yeah. was deaf so he expanded uh, the orchestra because he couldn't hear at some point yeah. he from, became from 36 yeah, sure. people to 108 <laughs> yeah and that's what he's famous for that's why everybody yeah. touts him as he's greater than mozart now mozart musically was brilliant the guy wrote stuff sure. straight out of his head you look at beethoven's scores the scribblings the crossings he he had a, he, it was tough for him he worked at it but he yeah. worked at it but what it came out with was beautiful right and, and he bridged the gap from from baroque to romantic, romantic music yeah. And mm. so the 50s, so there was, he was the last of the classical composers. Mozart sure. was in the middle. It was Haydn, Mozart, and then there was yeah. Beethoven. That's right. And Haydn taught them both, I think. He taught yes, Mozart, at least. Yeah, he taught Mozart, yeah. I can't remember and, if he taught well, he, Mozart. Well, Mozart studied Mozart. with everybody. Yeah, yeah. Mozart yeah. was the, a... The movie Amadeus really catches the essence of who he was. In my sure. Opinion. <laughs> Bit of a crazy guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> After my own heart. <laughs> well, since that, that's a, what a fantastic story that really brings home and I think again as we spoke about we're going to ask some questions that don't usually get asked and, right. and that that's a great because uh, sometimes you hear uh, some of the other details of wh wh who you produced and who you recorded right, with. Yeah. I think a lot of that info is out there already but I think today this is great to kind of hear well how did you get from point A to point, point B to B, point C man. and of course um, uh, you mentioned these synthesizers being monophonic 
obviously that was your your inspiration to go ahead and come up with a polyphonic synthesizer and so i want i want to come back in a minute to to that moment too and going ahead with stevie but i want to ask robert here because of course robert is younger and listening to some of this music that's about to happen <laughs> but um but let, let's kind of bridge the gap there and um Right after that, of course, you and Robert uh, are doing things with Stevie Wonder a few years later. But let's jump over and ask Robert here. Um, obviously, you heard those records. And yeah. tell me a little bit about where your head was at around 1970, 71, 72. The Stevie Wonder records are coming out, the records that we mentioned before. And this music's happening with mm -hmm. this gentleman and with Robert providing yeah, the synthesis. Yeah, making all the synth stuff. Yeah, yeah, Stevie. A lot of people forget, too, that Stevie... 1970, 71, 72. He's already a musician with records out for 10 yeah, years. Yeah. Yes. People always forget that. Like yeah. he, He's a, a veteran. Yes. T talk to us about that. You're getting into music, playing bass in the early 70s. Kind in of the influences. early 70s. Now I'll say I played with, um, and, and I started out, you know, basically making my own groups and things like that and playing around, learning how to play cover tunes. And I'm not a formally trained musician, so... I learned everything like the old school way off the records, and um, coming up in D.C. right, you're yes, Washington, in Washington D.C. Right? And my favorite musician that I never heard, but I heard about that inspired me to really want to carry on without no training, was um, the keyboard player. My mother's favorite. Um, um, wow, he's a real old dude. Uh, the I'll one I'll never forget what's his name. Uh, no, what's his name? What's his name? Uh, the guy from, he's, he's way before my time, but I only heard about him, and my mother told me about him. She had the records, okay. Uh, no, no. What, what is he? Let me think of this guy. What style was he? Jazz? Jazz. Total jazz. Okay. Like in my uh, mother's uh, time. Uh, no, no. He doesn't read music. Oh, uh, 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 Earl Garner. Uh, Earl Garner. So <laughs> my mom tells me about Earl Garner, and I, of course, we are too poor to afford any kind of lessons or instruments or anything. Sure. But I say I would like to play, and... I had a little guitar my uncle got me, had four strings on it, so I said, I want to be a musician. She said, but I don't know how I'm going to be able to do it because I won't be able to get trained, right? Right. So she says, well, Earl Garner didn't read music. If you believe you can do it, do it. Wow. So from there in the basement spark, yeah. to uh, a guy named Ricky Holmes who studied under that bassist I told you about sure. earlier uh, uh, from Eddie Kinder's group, Bernard right. Miles. So... From there to studying under Ricky Holmes to joining a Motown group, my first group, uh, they were the Dynamic Superior signed to Motown, produced by Nick Ashford and Valerie Simpson and wow. Holland Doja Holland and all those people. So sure. we traveled around, and I came in really early, myself and Gil's guitarist, Ed Brady. Okay. So we come in as like, well, he had been in it longer than me because he was like at 12 on the road. Right. So I come in at 16, but he's older than me. So we traveled with the superiors all around from 75 till we joined Gill in 79. Okay. So Malcolm's been here 10 years now that I hear the story, or right. 11 or so no. in America. In 79, I'm 20, I meet my mentor that he doesn't know he's my mentor because I'm already with Gill, who's my mentor too. <laughs> right, right. So he just discovers he's been, ment well he knows, but he's just discovering, I've been mentoring this guy the whole time and <laughs> I've taught you well. <laughs> so, so you guys met in 79. 79. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's, and, uh, and you had already done a record or two with, with Gil, but you, talk about that moment. The, the, the Okay, the we come out there the first, yeah. and you see, you, you heard about synthesizers, you already know about those albums that they did and all the bass sounds. Now, Lane, we're not talking about all the worry. No, talking about the bass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, how did they do this right. or whatever? And you've heard many moogs. Yeah. But you heard about Malcolm and Brian also. And Brian is becoming like a Stevie or something on this synthesizer. Brian thing. Jackson. Yeah, Brian yeah, Jackson. People, yeah. And. So we're going to cut the album, but Brian's not in the band anymore. Mm, right. So we're out there with Gil. I meet Malcolm at 20. Now this is to his teaching. He taught me this at 20. He's hustling around behind me. It's one of the first records I would play on that people would actually hear the stuff we did in Motown. They still kept changing the names, did whatever, and we were young guys just taking our beating. Malcolm would run around behind us young guys like as if we were Stanley Clark or somebody like that. That taught me humility, day one. This is what I walked into. Tonto and a guy so humble that you could not possibly believe, you know, 
the sounds he was getting out of the studio and all mm. everything that we wanted or you could dream of. Sure. He could pull it out. All the stuff for Brady, which meant that the bass was going to get treated right. Now I find out he's a bassist and he pulls out a 250-year-old bass then in 79. It was 250. Wow. I'll never forget it. And he had a 150-year-old one. He promised me that I hope I still can get. <laughs> <laughs> so we go on. And Malcolm is just like, once. this is the truth, because Brian's not there. Tonto's not. We're in Tonto, recording in Tonto, using it for whatever, like click tracks and stuff. In 79, right. you know, loops a couple years after that, like the first loop I ever heard, Tonto. That on anything. I've been in hip hop because I'm the young. I was the baby out of the Midnight Band and Amnesia Express. Wow. And wow. Gil's groups. You know, really the two the groups. One, yeah. uh, the two well known groups that Gil Scott had. Uh -huh. So we're doing things that don't exist. Malcolm's teaching us things that I tell him now and about. And he's kind of like, wow, you remember all those things that I, that <laughs> I taught y'all? Like. <laughs> like how to time a band on the verses with a stopwatch. Because how do you know how to stay in timing? And if you listen to all the records from before, not the ones he's producing or working with, because they're probably all steady, but all the records everybody else made, you can hear it if you put it on a stopwatch, because it didn't, That's nobody true. got steady until we digitized ourselves, and we had the total human feel back then. Another lesson. Right. Okay? Stay with the human feel, and, and you could recognize a second or so is what makes it all unique, you know? Because there was times where we were about five or six seconds off, and do it again. There right. he is, right there. Do it again. <laughs> he's just, well, coming out of the jazz, you know, yeah, years in, in, in England and London, and yeah. being one of the rhythm section, it's, it's all starting to make sense now. And uh, again, n learning the background of you gentlemen. I mean, a lot of people again, they know the the main history that's out there, but this is like lifting the hood and and like you know, yeah. wait, how did you come to that idea? Um, well, Gil Scott Heron again. Uh, what a loss! We spoke about this yeah. the other day. I oh, mean, it's it's tragic. It's beyond words. I mean, yeah. because uh, and I want to thank you, gentlemen, again uh, for for all the people, all the fans that are watching, mm -hmm. and uh, the people that uh, if you're watching, you're hardcore because this is <laughs> we're going into some stuff here. But but uh, want to thank you both too for for your dedication to the art because. Between you, when you look at the discography, you look yeah. at the things you did together, yeah. the Gil Scott Heron records that are that are history lessons. Each one of them, Absolutely. the politics, the 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 musical stuff, because the funk and the Motown yeah. and the R and B and the blues yes. messages that are in each of those tunes, mm -hmm. and yeah, it all makes part. so much sense uh, hearing your backgrounds and knowing that you know a few years earlier. Malcolm yeah, and Robert just had just him. created yeah. the whole thing with all the Stevie records. I mean, the template for 70s funk. Well, see, uh, I didn't work on any of the Stevie like records. Oh, well, I know right. you didn't. Yeah, but, but, but you were listening Malcolm, to them. Yes, you were working on them in your Malcolm bedroom. Was, yes, and Malcolm <laughs> was able to say things to us as young musicians, especially me and Brady. He would do things for us like this. We aspired to be like Stanley, Mingus, and him. He's right. my Mingus. This is my mentor for the rest of my life. Okay, in all the areas, I've become an engineer, I've become a producer, Gil is part of that too, because sure. they were the producers, mm -hmm. and they didn't just hold it back from us. Anybody that say they didn't have a fair shot in Gil's group, that's not true. He let us do everything, mm -hmm. put us before him. Yes. So this is the true story, okay? Mm -hmm. There's time where he didn't eat and so on, but we did. I uh -huh. know because I was there since the, the, the baby of the last the first baby of the first band and the last man standing in any of the bands. So yeah. there's no question. I know <laughs> who cared about what and who he cared about. And he cared about us all. Right. In a way, like a father, brother, Absolutely. mentor, and anything else you needed. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to talk about? That ain't real. He was a magnificent no. human being. <laughs> magnificent. The words speak being. for themselves. He could have said anything he wanted on the record and could have sold you butt shaking and anything else. But he showed you what you needed and what we're going to. He sold you what you needed or they sold you from his collections the things that he only worked on, which is positive, the future, work for peace, all those different things. And he never changed it up, never quit to the end. People would wonder why would he do say the same things over and over again, which is why we have to carry on with those words. There's not you don't need to fix nothing that's broke. It's not no, the, right. No. It's it's the words are what they are, and there's nothing better to be said. Sure. So now, what a beautiful that, that's a great uh, uh, statement that what you just said. Thank you, man. That was 
Um, no, he um, and I want people who, if you don't know Gil Scott Heron, other than a couple of the hits, uh, um, as it were, you know, there was a couple of hits, but please dig deep. And um, what's amazing too, uh, and I always say this, uh, uh, him and Frank Zappa were kind of coming mm-hmm. from the same direction where they somehow found a way to combine music, the political statements, the social statements. I think Gil went further into American history, African American history, bluesology, all these the things. The jails, the this, the <laughs> everything, the moon. The space shuttle, the NASA, Reagan, the presidents, Reagan. Well, the, well, that's the what I was congressmen, gonna say. the mayors, nuclear, yeah. nuclear power. Yeah. It's it's prophetic. I mean, the stuff he was talking about and that you guys recorded 30 years ago, it's all coming true. I mean, as we look at, uh, as we move into and South kind Africa, of a, a Africa before it was trendy. Yeah. Remember oh, yeah. when everybody jumped on the wagon? No yeah. one knew. People mm-hmm. thought that was. Um, so so do do some homework there, folks. If you don't know, Gil Scott Heron dig deep a lot of people know Stephen Wonder know the hits now you know this is the gentleman programming those mode bases on some of those things I want to talk about that for just a minute the musical thing I mean because and if you have friends that are bass players make sure they watch this because uh, <laughs> you know there is so much I'm going to I'm going to say most of the bass in <laughs> all of you know uh, starting from 1970 the, the, the things that became the template bass lines the funk lines in all of the music we know, you know, between you starting it out on the on the synthesizer, and then the important records that you played on. Yeah. Wow, the bass energy in this room. I mean, let's look at some some specifics for a minute. I mean, you think about the Moog bass line on "Too High." Oh yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, the, the thousands. We all know it by heart. The thousands of tracks that rip that off oh yeah and and here's the man just talk for just a minute about that just that one track for instance the, Mo the sound too please in. for me because I, 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 I need to know about how you got that sound and, 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 and we're gonna wrap we up with to, hold on, we're gonna wrap up with a couple Angel of these Dust. things the oh, bass well, sound well that was on. my next oh, thing thank you gosh, I <laughs> kill you're next you're up next but let's we're gonna wrap up a little bit with just with some musical things tell us about too high and your memories of yeah that well Mo too bass. high um Stevie and I, we, we used to have some interesting conversations because Stevie being unsighted, he had his own unique way of playing. He played what sort of flat fingered um, and he used his thumbs to find where he was oh. on the edge of the, uh, of the keyboard. So he played predominantly on the black notes. And I used to tell him, hey Stevie, you're prejudiced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so basically his response to that was, you know, well, Hey man, you know this is this is this is easy for me. But so I said to him, well, you know, you're building chords all the time in thirds, piled up thirds. It's not the only way to do it, because I've been studying arranging since I was 15. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, there's a guy called Gil Evans mm-hmm. and Bill Evans who are not the same guy, and they're not right. the same family even, but <laughs> right. they're both called the same Evans. Uh, Bill Evans being the pianist, the jazz pianist. Uh, who built chords in fourths and flat and fifths. They didn't use thirds. And it gives an entirely different sound. Mm-hmm. It's an entirely different way of... Th- so, and I was saying, like this, and you can move around in different keys. And I was going... And I was showing him chromatically the fourth things. And da 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 I said, great idea. So we got the Wonder Love singers, the girls, Lonnie Groves, sure. and, uh, Tasha th- Thomas, Tasha yeah. Thomas and uh, uh, Shirley. Uh, um, uh, is it Serena? I, I, I name was it Serena? Like no, okay. Anyway, no, okay. they came the and he third. talked, and they did the thing as a vocal thing. Ah, uh, yeah. And we, the idea was uh, about too high. The whole idea is an anti drug song. Right, right. Now, sure. Gil did an anti drug song, sure. Angel Dust. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Now, the difference between Gil and Stevie is Gil had. Uh, Gil was a, 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 a doctor of English literature. Yeah. He actually taught at Johns Hopkins. He sure. was a professor there. Uh, he, le- he studied at Lincoln 
University. That's where he met Brian that Jackson. Was master was at John Hopkins. Yeah. Taught at Federal City College in D.C. Right. There you go. So you, yeah. You, 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 you a true professor. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A true professor. A wordsmith par excellence with a rapier-like tongue and wit. You could never get the better of him in word games. No, I play word games never. and puns and things. You could never <laughs> win with Gil. English Gil telling you just that now. Queen. Zap you down. <laughs> he just... Monster. monster. He was an absolute... And his mind... <laughs> boof. Quick, 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 quick. Oh, just we used to have a lot of fun together, play, playing with puns and things, yeah. and he would take things and turn them on, turn them around, <laughs> and it, it, was, it was hilarious. We used to have a great deal of fun. But Gil had this ability, he was quite willing to name names, places. Yeah, yeah. 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 Stevie, on the other hand, was much more general. Okay. Sure, sure. Kept you, ta you, open, yeah. you take, you know, your name is Big Brother. You say you're watching me on the telly. Well, that was after I'd been reading Stevie, uh, Big Brother, and George Orwell's right. 1984, and excerpts from 1984, but the whole of Animal Farm. Oh, and, wow. and so he, he came up with this idea, you know, for this song. And I, when he came in, it was like, oh, you know, uh, I got this new song. I said, yes, Stevie, another bloody love, love song, love. sure. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Just roll the tape, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But that's, the, you just that dropped. A different, different song. Right? That's a different yeah. song, but you just dropped a real heavy thought that I never thought of. You're also the dude who read some stuff to Stevie Wonder, because, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's obvious someone is reading him things. Because before we had... Talking well, books, yeah, well, we as we, it were, which is one of his. But uh, no, that that's. Um, but but that song again. Uh, it's hard. amazing to hear uh, uh, where the harmonic structure came, and then that, and then you just added the bass. You just decided. Oh it, well, the first thing we ever do with Stevie, with the exception of Superstition. Every other one uh, song started with a keyboard and Stevie's voice. Okay. Even if he was just going la 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 la, you know, right. very superstitious la 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 la, very keyboard. superstitious la 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 la. Yeah. La 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 la. We didn't have the hook at the beginning. Right. And a lot of the hooks came out of just kibitzing backwards and forwards. Hey man, we need a hook. Oh, how about when you believe in things you don't understand, you can suffer. You know, mm -hmm. superstition ain't the way. Well, this, the hook is not superstition ain't the way. The hook right. is when you believe in things you don't understand, right, yeah, right. you can suffer. Yeah, and yeah. that was the, that's the real key thing, and that was where the, the big change mm -hmm. places. Now, who wrote that line? I, I don't know who it was. Stevie gets the credit because it's his song. Yeah. But we talked about it, and to get the words for superstition, I had to lock him in because it was written for Jeff Beck. I don't know if right, you know that right. story. Yeah, yeah. And he, uh, 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 Jeff was going back to England, the following day and I needed to get the vocal down. We didn't have any words and I locked Stevie in the, the room. When he came in, I rotated him around 50 to backwards and forwards to disorient him. Wow. And I shoved him, instead of going in the studio, I shoved him in the production room, which is opposite okay. the studio, with my secretary, Katie, who was 140 IQ, Mensa. Uh, she'd, she'd, she'd do the, the, the London Times, Sunday, Sunday Times crossword in half an hour. That which yeah. is remarkable. She was an amazing lady, and she's very, very literate. And, and Stevie, however, was not a, a lyricist, and so you get these lyrics. That don't, you know, I locked him in there and said, "You're not coming out until I get the lyrics." And, the song, yeah. you, and not, I'm not even opening the door. You have to slide them under the door to me. It was one of those <laughs> things, and it took him all afternoon to do this. And mm. Katie was in there. Now, how much Katie wrote, I don't know. But uh, we came out. Thirteen months old baby broke the looking glass. <laughs> seven years of bad luck, good things in the past. What the hell's that mean? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah. a bunch of nonsense. Right? Exactly. Everybody <laughs> got it though. As soon as it came yeah. out, right. right? It's a little dolly esque, but <laughs> it works. Now that that's an amazing story. I mean, again, what's beautiful, guys, is uh, again as we wrap up, we want you. To come back to Asheville, we want you to come back. Yeah, and but do before you go, oh, no, you no, gotta no. let him I'm, tell. Gonna, him. He's gonna tell the angel that okay, story. Okay, I'm gonna come because, back. Because uh, I just want to know how was that bass you sound bass created? Sound, yeah. When there's some, I know it's a fretlessy <laughs> type thing or whatever. Yeah. Sure. But now I'm just gonna say this small part. Uh, Can yeah, you then I'll reintroduce it. Getting ready to play this bass line, and you actually think it's a bass. Right. And you're like, how do you create this sound? Yeah. Because yeah. it sounds exactly like we. Well, we, I, everybody, all the bass players, all of us thought. This is a Gill's bass player. Right. I didn't play on that record. That's Brian on the synth, and Malcolm doing what he did with Stevie sure. with the sound. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out which was a problem because I forever gave Brian credit until I understood later. So I'm like, oh, no wonder you used to laugh when I used to go, I hate you for that bass line. <laughs> no wonder you used to laugh because I'm going, Malcolm then made some kind of tone that when I saw him on Soul Train and Brady's in the band, I'm going to join the band in two months now. And I'm going, the guys miming, but 
in 79 and 8, you don't know. You ain't thinking like fleeing them last time on the awards or the Super yeah, right, Bowl. Right, You're right. Not, nobody calls you and say, they weren't playing right there. <laughs> right, right. Man, they was on there. And I was like, Gil was known for always having, like, I'm not miming. So he was live, I think, or something. And the rest, he refused to mime. So he was live. And the bass player's doing the mime thing with that tone. So you know what I felt? Total hate for all y'all. I'm joining the band. I, I got to play this. And the dude's doing the fun thing with it. So I'm like, gosh, he's leaving the band? How am I going to get this sound? Right. This don't even, you know, yeah, right. what There's bass no is this? Yeah. Right. You know this. You can't even hum that one. Right. <laughs> How you do it? Well, yeah, tell us about the, <laughs> tell us about the well, angels that's bass sound. I know it's Tonto. Robbie, I know I'm your mentor and everything, but I could tell you. But if I do, I gotta kill you. I have to kill you. Yes, this is the classic well, grasshopper. And I will don't want to do that. So. <laughs> well, that no, though, that that's I, I wasn't sure who played it on the record. I mean, I've seen you play live a few times. Yeah, you did a damn good job. I mean, well, see, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, that punishment from that made me be able to try to. Now, now that's what he told me about Reggie. That right. I want to say about that. That was that's, it's an honor for you to say that about the electric Reggie. How he's the only one that played those bass lines. Because yeah. you knew Reggie what they LeBron. really sound like. Yeah. And he was the only one that could make them sound like what Stevie had done on a bass without all, he, you know, you don't have Tonto behind you. Right. So yeah. I appreciate that because, man, to try to create that sound, even though it was a fretless sound, I'm playing fretted. Sure. I don't even have a fretless yet because I was playing an R&B group. Right, right. Fretless came later and all that well, on Is That Jazz, which he had yeah. the song. Oh, great <laughs> no, that, what a great track. No, again, we have to do this again because yeah. you gentlemen, we can't even, we scratch the surface today. Oh, yeah. this is going to be a and long one. The, 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 the great <laughs> records that uh, that we have to talk about, I mean, the, the uh, just do, do your research, folks. We've got a lot of scholars who watch this show, but go punching in YouTube. Uh, Gil Scott Heron, Angel Dust, live. and Because mm -hmm. you always used to feature Robert on that song. And, uh, Secretary of Entertainment. Well, in fact, Brother when, Robert G is the man to see about the RSVP. Yes. On, a on a party, party but no, no Angel a Dust a and no a dipping a because boom, we got boom. the remix. Malcolm and I have the remix of the new Angel Dust for you new dippers. We got it <laughs> coming right, for you. Right. So no <laughs> dipping this summer and look out for the banging track, okay? <laughs> well, when I walked up to you yesterday, I haven't seen you in... 20 years I walked right, right up and, and once we you were like wait I reckon it yeah oh, Robert G you know and I, I yeah. right away I said you know Dr. Robert G is the man to see I was thinking <laughs> he looks Bible. like this guy I met in New York that said hey man you sound really good I'm a close friend of Marcus Miller. I'm going to tell him about you. You are in trouble. <laughs> I was thinking, is that that guy that was like made Marcus right, go is, that way? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, uh, oh, no, no, last story. Oh, yeah. So okay. this guy said that we to me. A minute or two. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. This guy said that to me, and I was thinking when I'm looking at you, because I knew I met you on the East Coast. Yeah. I'm going... Is that that guy? And I ain't want to say it to you now because you're telling me about the tech stuff you're doing. I'm going, I bet you that's him. I won't remind him of that story. I'm not. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's, it's great to, to um, be um, uh, uh, adding you guys to our, our, our continuing series here. Because for me, um, and, and we talked about this the other day, and, and it was one of the places we met, um, I, I started out in, in kind of, whether this is journalism or uh, music his, history or musicology, whatever you want to call it, what, what I try to do. But as a, uh, a young one, man, I was maybe, tw I was 20, 21, 20 or so, I interviewed Gil, we were talking mm -hmm. about this, I interviewed Gil for my, my college newspaper, in Rutgers, right. Livingston mm -hmm. College in, in Rutgers. Right. Well, we about the show. Yeah, and I, I actually, I sh I sh we should maybe get a clip of it and put it up. I had a cover story yeah. in the Livingston newspaper 1985, 86, Gil came to the college, yeah. and you and Ron Holloway yeah. were hanging out, and we brought him, in, and I have a cassette somewhere. Wow. But but it, it, it kind of funny, you guys had been driving all day, and Gil fell asleep, like, towards the end of the interview, and it's on the tape, Gil's like, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you hear Ron on the tape, Gil, Gil. hey Gil, man, huh? Oh, oh, oh. you know, but, but, but that's, so it's kind of fun, like, all these years later, to still yeah. be in music kind of journalism or whatever but on a here we are on the internet doing it mm -hmm. so so we'll do this again and um let's just the, the very last thing to touch on is today we always bring it back to today you gentlemen are playing tomorrow at, for moog fest you're, you're doing some recording so yes. that'll be up on the web and we'll yes. link up to that performance so you can see what these guys are doing today and and tell us very quickly what's coming up in the next few months you're going to be recording writing music you're absolutely 
both of those things. Okay, we're going great. to be recording. We, we, we did a concert two weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, at Columbia Green Community College. Great. Um, with a so we'll look online four, uh, four well, no six other musicians there were six, eight of okay. us in tour Great. in total <clears throat> and during that we did this two bass thing uh, which really took off and the people absolutely loved yeah. it they Great. responded so positively to it that yeah. we said wait a minute this is th there's yeah. something going on here and my wife Polly is very critical very critical lady she's like mm -hmm. you know She's That's good. She, she's she's That's good. she's seen it all, done it all, and everything. And it's like, mm -hmm. and she was like, "This is good. Wow. This is good. You should. We should. You should carry on with this. This is really something Great. else. This is God special. bless you, Polly. You know I love you. <laughs> she's always been my. <laughs> and it's upright bass and electric bass and upright and electric bass. bass. And, and we've gone. We've gone now. We can announce the upright is now MIDI. Sorry. That's great. Yeah. And we were talking about <laughs> that. With yeah. the help with the help of the people from the good people from the Mug Factory. That's fantastic. And we're going right, to we're going to come back and do a thing just on the tech that yeah. you guys do. Yeah. Um okay, and what's it called? What's the project called? That people can Google and well, we haven't got a title yet. That's but a great we have, title. That's very uh, strange. Well, that was one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> we said that. But no. we, we, we came up, we went to see um, the Gaslight Ghost. Killer. Yes. Okay. And, yeah. and, and, and we were talking about the, 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 the low end and everything. Yeah. That and we came up with, do we want to tell them what we came up with? Okay. You have to promise to buy this, our first CD. Okay. Yeah. Now we don't know whether it's the name of the group or the name of the CD, but <laughs> the C or, or, or the name of a track. We haven't decided yet. But we came up. We sort of it's a borrowed challenge. a little it's bit. It's a challenge. Gaslight Killer, sure. and we decided we were going to be Woofer Killer. Woofer. And we dare you to play our <laughs> CD. Sure. We dare you to play Killing our CD. The we're going to dare people to play our CD. Yeah. And, and it'll With blow your money woofers. system. <laughs> that's great. No, the, well, that's okay. Lord of the Lows. You know, I lost Stanley, and then with the tune, <laughs> and 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 uh, MalcolmCecil dot com. People can uh, find it, stuff. Actually, What's the website? We're, we're, at the moment, uh, MalcolmCecil dot com. We could set, we could set up, mm -hmm. but we're gonna we're, we're gonna come up with a okay uh, a, a proper thing. Right now, the active um, the, the active website is Tonto Studio dot com. Tonto Studio, Tonto right? Studio. But okay. The, 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 we will post everything sure, on that on website, there, so people but can we will have our own website. I, I don't know, we've got to check whether Wolf Killer is available. Right, right, right. And we better do it before this goes out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Matter, we can, we can we still will kill out. the Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he just went, yeah. We can pop this. And then and you and I had our first collaboration yesterday. We came up with, we were joking around. Yeah. And what, what's the album title for, because um, with the Moog thing, with uh, Craig Leon, you're going to yeah. do... Some we're going to do, do 21st century uh, version of Switched On Bar. Yeah. And, and, and what was the name? We were joking around yesterday. Uh, 21st century um, Switched On Bar. Yeah. Switched On Bar. <laughs> yeah. Century Switched On Bar. Because 21st the first century was, Switched On Bar. <laughs> <laughs> the, first, it's the, the first record that came out. See, it's the 50th anniversary of, of, of Bob, Bob Moog and, and, and Herb Deutsch coming up with the first synthesizer right uh, and then but uh, in, a few years later um of course walter now wendy carlos right. did switched on bach now right. switched on bach works because it's baroque music bach sure. was baroque music and the organ and the harpsichord had no touch monophonic lines right so and monophonic lines mm -hmm. so, so it works mm -hmm. for for really the does. old style original style mode but now we've got a whole different set of things it's a whole different set of parameters things have gone moved a tremendous amount in that 50 years and we're going to be uh, Craig Leon uh, has has uh, spoken to Sony UK right and they're 100 percent behind this right and so uh, we're going to tomorrow we're going to do the the, the, the first taste of this fantastic and so we'll, we'll put a link up for that and, and Google Craig Leon, folks, if you don't know who that is, another producer, produced Bondi, all kinds of bands. And the yeah, Ramones. Ramones. Uh, he, he's a classic. So, and oh. a lovely guy. He's a classical composer and arranger. Right. And he's, he lives in England now, in Oxford. And he's a wonderful guy. And, you know, he and his lady Castle. Right. Uh, they're, they're, they're delightful people. And... Um, He's, he's very, you know, he's very gung-ho. He's like, I said, yeah. Yeah, it. let's know, do it. And let's do it. Let's go, blah, 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 blah. And he's, you know, it's going to be a pleasure to do this, this, well, this we project. We can't wait. Him. We can't wait. We're going to, and by then it'll happen. We'll link it up. We'll link up to the mm -hmm. Moog site and stuff. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, it's been great. We're going to, we're going to wrap. But uh, thank you so much. And again, welcome to Asheville. Welcome to thank you, man. Uh, the, the I Am Asheville Studios. Um, 
folks we'll see you soon